have you ever purchased something and had it delivered or brought it home and you opened the box and you saw those dreaded three words when you got the box open that said, some assembly required? Well, I don't know about you, but for me, that's about the worst possible thing I can see. I'm just not handy at all. And some assembly required usually means chaos ahead. I was thinking about that the other day when I was talking to a student about how to write their bar exam essays. And one of the things I had noticed was that their answer had a lot of the right pieces, a lot of the right elements. They had the law correct. They even had correct conclusions. They seemed to understand what was going on in the problem. But effectively, their answer felt a lot like the jumble puzzle pieces behind me. They were all just laid out in different places, and it was up to the reader to assemble and put them together. And I thought what a perfect analogy that was for the way that the essay writing process tends to go for a lot of people. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about the idea of some assembly required and why it's not a good strategy when you're writing a bar essay and what you should be doing instead. And I thought the way that we could do that would be to begin by looking at what I call the traditional paradigm of essay writing. The thing that many of you learned in law school and that seems to be the holdover for a lot of folks when they're studying for the bar exam. In fact, I think it's probably implicitly what most bar review courses uh, accept as being the right way to write these days. Now, essentially, the elements of a traditional paradigm writer are that what you want to do when you receive an essay is to spot as many issues as possible. As many things that jump out at you and seem like they could be problems, no matter how remote or distant they might be, you simply want to get them all on paper. And so the idea is to just throw out as many different issues as you can immediately, get them on the paper, do something to identify that you see all the possibilities that are there. Now, recognizing that there is an infinite range of possible issues in any problem, I think it's interesting when someone takes that approach because they begin with a very, very broad focus instead of narrowing down as to what really is more important. And we'll talk about what I think is a preferred approach in a moment. But I just simply want to point out that in the some assembly required methodology, the idea is get as many puzzle pieces on the floor as you can, start with as many issues as you can, and throw them out onto the paper. Now, the second thing that I think most uh, people that are doing when they're using the traditional paradigm is that they're trying to recite as many rules or elements of law as they can. Now, in order to do that, a lot of folks will memorize. They'll take an inordinate amount of time to create flashcards or to review mnemonics or to create songs. In fact, I even heard the other day, someone made this really lengthy, very complicated mnemonic about uh, printers and, and jams in the 3D printer. And somehow this very long story was designed to help you in civil procedure. And frankly, by the time you've learned the story and all of the elements and all of the things that are there, I would think that you've already used up a substantial amount of your time, much less the study time it takes. Now, I know that it's clever to do mnemonics. I, I get that, and I respect the people that can come up with these wonderful stories and mnemonic devices. But ultimately, it's not very productive when you're simply list, using it to list elements. And a lot of what happens in the sum assembly required methodology is that you start seeing random rules popping up at different places in the answer. A little bit like, uh, again, putting the pieces of, of the box uh, just dumping them on the floor and seeing where they fall. So here's a rule, and over here's another rule, and maybe over here's some elements to another rule. And certainly if we're talking about negligence or formation of a contract, we're going to list all those elements because we all know them. It's a little tougher to do when we get into the more esoteric subjects, and so there's a lack of consistency. Sometimes I'll provide all the elements, sometimes I won't, uh, but I'll just throw out as many rules as I can remember. The assumption here is that the bar examiners actually have a long checklist of rules. And the more rules you mention in whatever context you mention them in, you're gonna get credit for. Now, it's been my experience that that's absolutely untrue, but I think that's the paradigm that a lot of bar takers use. Well, I can recite 20 rules that relate to a contracts problem, so I'm going to be successful on the exam. If only it were that simple. But in fact, it's not. And so the recitation of elements and the spotting of issues tends to be two of the pieces that just sort of fall onto the page in some uh, relatively randomized order. Now, the third thing that actually doesn't happen in this traditional paradigm is that you don't see many facts being used. The facts somehow become irrelevant or less intellectual or less academic. 
Uh, the presumption is that you should not repeat facts because obviously everyone knows them. Unfortunately, it's facts that give the context, the texture, the feeling, and the, the, the ability to understand what's really going on in the problem. And if you don't use the facts, then everything else that you put out, the rules and the elements and the, the issues, tend to just float as though they're ungrounded uh, or un, untethered uh, from any kind of reality. And so we have these random rules, random issues, they're floating around and there's no context for any of them because the writer simply hasn't bothered to use the facts. Now that's an acceptable approach when everyone knows the facts and everyone agrees on the facts, but as I'm gonna show you in a moment in the bar exam world, that's simply not true. And so you have this lack of grounding or lack of perspective and context and it makes everything else a little crazier. Something else that we see in the traditional paradigm is a very high word count. You know, it's not unusual to see uh, in a 60-minute essay uh, an issue spotting, uh, you know, a randomized rule, uh, an element writer, uh, getting upwards of 2,500 words in a 60-minute answer, or in a 30-minute UBE answer, uh, getting something over 1,500 words. That's a lot of typing to do. It's almost impossible in your handwriting, but for, certainly for typists, it's just an extraordinary amount to put on the page. And you have to ask yourself, is it really worth all of those words? In other words, out of those big word counts, how many actually matter? And what I've discovered is that we have a lot of word salad going on. There's a lot of random, strange, uh, un uh, connected ideas happening in the answer. And so you tend to get these run-on sentences with very long memorized rules attached to them and just sort of appended onto the end of an issue. And somehow that is perceived by the writer to be successful writing. It's going to, to help the, the reader evaluate their work. Now, you notice that what I'm really describing here so far is IRAC writing, issue, rule, and this is the application. We're just going to write lots and lots and lots of words with these rules we made. And then at the very end, we're going to tack on a conclusion. It's kind of a, therefore, it should be X. And the conclusion is, again, seen as something less important, less valuable, um, because it's really the uh, logical end to something, but since we didn't start logically, it's hard to have a logical finish. I mean, I had an issue over here and I had some elements and rules over here and I had uh, some applications somewhere else. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose if I had to write a conclusion, I could, but most of the time I, I just won't bother doing that. And I run out of time because I'm trying to do so much. Well, those are the puzzle pieces, if you will, that are thrown on the, the table or on the desk uh, when someone is using this traditional paradigm of writing. Now, you might ask yourself, and I think it would be a reasonable question, why would anyone choose to write this way? And I think the answer really comes from a couple of, of standpoints. First, I think an awful lot of folks have been lulled into believing that this will work because it's what they did in law school. But, you know, there's a substantive and substantial difference between the reader in law school and the reader on the bar exam. Let me be explicit. In law school, you had a professor that taught you for 18 weeks or maybe 32 weeks, whatever it might have been. They had their own particular area of specialization, and on their exam, what they're primarily trying to determine is whether or not you have paid attention and learned the subject matter of that particular subject. And obviously, there's pressure in law school to pass a student and move them on to the next level so that that seat can be filled by a new tuition-paying student. Also, law professors tend to be more generous because they clearly know the facts of the fact patterns that they wrote personally, um, and they may know you as a student, even if they don't know specifically who's writing which uh, particular answer, but they have a sense of what's going on, and they tend to be a more, uh, I, I hate to say more uh, genial audience or a more uh, malleable audience, uh, because most of the law professors I knew were anything but that. However, they are generally speaking more in your favor than you would think. And so they take their time and they look and they assemble, they see all the pieces on the floor and they say, oh, well, here's some rules I taught and here's some issues that I told people to look for. And here's a little bit of application that, that seems to make sense. And I can kind of assemble that and put it all together and see that that's a good, solid uh, gentleman or gentlewoman's B+. Plus. Okay. And at a lot of schools, that's what happens. In fact, a lot of the best law schools don't even bother to give grades anymore. As long as you're able to put some rules on the final and have some analysis, then you're probably going to be okay. Spot a few issues and you pass. 
And that's the standard that a lot of bar takers bring coming out of law school or maybe from their prior law school experience. And I think it makes sense. That's what law school is looking for. But now I want you to flip it over to the practice of law. And I really would say, particularly to those of you who've been practicing law, you couldn't get away with that same approach in your day-to-day -day practice of law. You couldn't write letters to clients or file motions with the court or present cases to juries that were as chaotic and uh, as literally some assembly required as what we've just been describing. It just wouldn't work. You'd lose your jury. You'd lose your case. You'd uh, be in trouble with your client. You'd have trouble with your boss. It just wouldn't work. It's sloppy and frankly, to some extent, it's just lazy writing. Now, I know that's going to upset some people when I say that this is lazy. And I don't mean that the individual is lazy, but the writing itself simply doesn't take the time to do the assembly. It says some assembly is required. And by the way, I'm under time pressure here as a writer, so I don't have time to do the assembly. And you, dear reader, it's up to you to do it. I think that's one part of the problem is that law school has uh, enabled this kind of approach uh, in, in the exams. The other problem, candidly, is that most of the big box bar reviews are simply uh, complicit in that process. They know, as well as I do, that it's not a good way to write. And they know it's not going to be terribly successful. But frankly, it's a lot of work to get people to change those habits. And it's much easier, particularly if your primary business model is built on helping 3Ls pass the bar exam, it's much easier to let those folks do what they were doing in law school than to try and get them to change for the bar exam. Now, that was all good when you had 70, 80, 90% pass rates for first time takers. Today, you don't have that anything near that. In fact, now most people that take the bar exam will fail. And for most people, it will take as much as four exams to pass. And that's two full years of bar taking. And the reality is that a whole lot of people get their head bashed in in the some assembly required approach and only later in the game come to realize that they have to do something different. And so, Candidly, I think that, that the bar review companies and the law schools have simply been uh, what I would think of as uh, purveyors of benign neglect when it comes to writing. They don't care about it. It's not important. It's not academic or intellectual enough at the law school level. And the bar review companies don't have the expertise to teach it generally, so they just let it go the way it is. And then occasionally you see someone that comes along and says, well, we're going to really uh, be clever about mnemonics, or we're going to be clever about memorization, or we're going to be clever about recitation. But no one puts it all together, and no one shows a bar taker what to do. Well, having laid down that challenge now, let me see if I can help you figure out what you should be doing. The approach that we teach at Celebration Bar Review is grounded, I think, much more in the realistic practice of law and what good writing entails, regardless of what level it is. One of the first qualities of good writing is to understand your reader, to understand your audience. I think if you're going to understand the bar exam grader, you need to recognize why they are different than a law school professor. First of all, the grader is typically not a professional bar examiner. Now, there are a few small states that still have their examiners uh, do the, the grading, but those are becoming more and more uh, the, uh, the, the one-offs and not the norm. If, for example, in California today, most of the grading is done by contract employees, people who took and passed the Cal Bar on their first or second try and who are willing to work for $3.25 an answer that they grade. Now, I want you to think about that 325 for a minute. That's less than uh, the barista uh, at my local Starbucks uh, for my skinny venti mocha uh, gets paid. And so the result is that I'm getting more love from the barista than I get from the bar exam grader. I've talked in other places about this picture of the bar exam grader who's working for the uh, examiners, typically making about $1,000 in the exam season, reading essays uh, or performance tests, on a single topic, a single question, uh, as a way to uh, supplement their income. It's the gig employee. And I've described them as the Uber grader. You know, they drive an Uber by day and they grade bar exam essays by night. And I don't mean this in a demeaning way. I'm simply pointing out that what we've got now is a very different reader. This is someone who's not a judge. They're not a partner in a law firm. They're not a professor in law school. They're not even uh, an academic in any sense of the word. They're simply people hired to grade essays. 
Now, they are given direction and they're told what to do. They're given something called a drafter's point sheet. But the drafter's point sheets don't say, here are the issues that you have to, to look at or here are the rules you have to see. They literally go through a step-by-step -step analysis of the problem. In fact, that's the model that we use to teach writing, just what's in the drafter point sheets. And you might say, well, why wouldn't everybody do that? Well, go back to my first point that the law schools and the big box bar reviews don't have an incentive to do it. And so they just ignore it. But you know, when you look at a drafter's point sheet, it's very clear. It's set up in a logical, orderly, concise fashion. Here's the first problem. Here are the facts. Here's the arguments that could be made and the law that would support those arguments. And here's the preferred result. That's exactly how we teach writing. No difference whatsoever. So one of the things that happens is that because we are now writing in a way that matches what the graders are looking at, what they're using to grade, we see better results for our students. Our approach to writing is built on the idea that instead of trying to throw out lots of issues and then randomly assemble those with elements of law and ignoring the facts, what we want is greater clarity and greater depth and more organization. And we do it really pretty simply. We ask the writer to set up their answer built on the call of the question and to focus in on factually what's happened in each of those parts of the problem and then to analyze what the competing parties' positions would be. You know, what we teach people to do is to take the problem and break it down into smaller component parts, to start with the particular uh, calls of the question, and then to create a, con a factual context, building from the factual context into the arguments that would be made on both sides of the dispute and the law that would support those arguments, and then moving to a logical conclusion. Now, this approach is radically different than issue spotting because instead of saying, what are all the marginal things that are out there, we're now actually telling a story. There's a narrative to what we're doing. Here's the problem. Here's the position of the first party and the law that they would use, the position of the opposing party and the law that they might rely on, and the result that we think would obtain. When you do that, what's happening is that you're leading the reader step by step through the problem. You're no longer saying you need to assemble this answer, but instead you're doing the assembly for them. Now, what that allows you to do is that in the same time frame that you would have had before, you're now able to get at the heart of the problem. Instead of being on the margins of the problem, talking about all of the potential issues, some of which simply won't be in dispute, you're now looking at what is actually in conflict. And sometimes people say, well, why would you think about conflicts or disputes as compared to issues? And the answer is very simply, the examiners create in the fact pattern a certain number of disputes or conflicts. They do that so that you'll write about them. They don't want you writing issues because the issues are not part of what they're worried about. Issue spotting is not something in the practice of law that's rewarded. Let me just think about it for a minute. If you went to your client and you said, well, I know you want me to just handle this slip and fall case, but I see issues around um, the safety of, of footwear in America. Well, your client's not interested in paying for that, nor is the jury interested in hearing it, nor is the judge going to be willing to have you do it. And the partner you're working for is certainly not gonna be thrilled when you come back with that in your memo when they've asked you to handle the slip and fall. You see, there's nothing in judicial efficiency and economy that suggests that issue spotting is really what we wanna do. And so when you write an essay that way, you're writing uh, in a way that isn't really representative of what you do as a lawyer, and therefore it's not rewarded very well. We think that what's much more important is to have a well-organized answer that's got analysis that shows how you use the law as you know it. Now, I recognize that one of the, the, the claims against this writing style is to say that, yes, you have to know the law cold. You know, I've read literally tens of thousands of answers in probably more than 35 jurisdictions in the country over the last 30 years. And I can tell you that I have read lots of bar essays in which the law was absolutely dead wrong and they got a passing score. At the same time, I've also read lots of essays in which they got the law absolutely correct and failed. So you see, I don't think it, you can draw a causality here and say getting the law right or wrong is the reason that you pass or fail. It really is a more complex uh, formula than that. And the formula, I think, is one that says, tell, take the reader through your reasoning, make a good faith uh, argument, and then show how you would use the law and show us the result you would receive. Now, you can't not know the law on every essay and get away with it, to be sure. 
But if you've been doing your studying, you know most of the law, and you've got it paraphrased at the very least. But the people that spend their time trying to memorize it word for word don't get any great value. I don't see a higher score in a memorized rule when it's simply dumped on the floor as part of the sum assembly required writing. Now, if you happen to know a rule word for word, well, good, but I don't think it's the best and highest use of your time as you study. And so I would encourage you, instead of trying to memorize, creating flashcards or mnemonics or attack outlines, that instead what you do is you paraphrase the law as you understand it. And in our course, we use tools like photo reading and mind mapping as a note-taking system to help you learn how to do that paraphrase under time conditions. The ultimate goal of all of this, however, is to bring to the reader, instead of some assembly required, no assembly required. Just open it up and it's all right there. You know, I get thrilled when I get a delivery from a, a furniture company and the, the furniture is already assembled. It's ready to go. I am not a big fan of Ikea. And when I get that Ikea box, oh my gosh, that is not what I want to be doing. Maybe you feel the same way. You know, I think for the bar grader who is a contract employee, if you ask them to do assembly for you as a writer, you are taking a huge risk. You're betting that the uh, grader will have the interest and the time to do that work for you and give you the benefit of the doubt. You know, I find that a lot of bar takers are surprised when I say to them that the average time a bar grader spends on an essay is about five minutes. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about a 30 minute essay or a 60 minute essay. And when you think about a five minute read, I think you can easily imagine that some assembly required is simply not going to be available to you. The examiner needs to see what you've done and how you've done it very quickly in order to make a decision. That requires predictability, it requires good organization, and it doesn't require a lot of words. You know, I gave you some word counts earlier that I thought that the traditional paradigm required. If we're talking about a 60 minute essay, our students write very successful answers at 1,200 words, not 2,500 words. And in a 30-minute essay, they write very successful answers at 750 words, not 1,500 words. Why? Because you don't need all the extra verbiage. You don't need to say more or write more or spot issues or throw out random pieces of information. If you lead the reader step-by-step step through the analysis that you've done, you can be finished much more effectively. And if you focus just on the disputes and the conflicts, then you are at the heart or the center of the examiner's bullseye, and that's what it takes to be successful. So I think that at the end of the day, with you, uh, as you prepare to, to write your essays for the bar exam, you need to ask yourself, how much work do you want the reader to do for you? Good writing has always been about making it perfectly easy for the reader to follow what you wanna do. I found that when I wrote uh, briefs for the Supreme Court, when I uh, clerked for a federal judge, uh, we were always looking and looking for the simplest, straightest path to reach a conclusion. The briefs and, and replies and uh, motions that were made that were obscure, that were uh, laid out in ways that, that made it harder for us as a reader to understand what the writer wanted, were hardly ever successful, even if they were right as a matter of law. When you practice law, it's important that you recognize who your audience is and speak directly to them. I think that one of the mistakes that bar takers make when they come to the exam is not knowing who their reader is, not understanding the task that's in front of them, and having spent the wrong amount of time and effort preparing for something that's really not going to pay a dividend. So instead of writing with an instruction that says some assembly required, when it's time to write your essay, I suggest that what you do is to write no assembly required, just follow these directions.